Well, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to St Paul's Cathedral for this Sunday Forum. Uh, My name is Jonathan Brewster, I'm the Canon Treasurer of St Paul's and it's my great privilege to chair uh, this meeting today. Let me explain for those who haven't been here before uh, what happens. Our speaker will speak for about 40 minutes uh, and then we'll have about 20 minutes or so for questions, after which we'll wrap up Uh, promptly at two o'clock as I'm sure uh, people will have things that they need to go to. Uh, Let me introduce to you our speaker for today. Uh, Dr Krish Kandaya is the award-winning author of 12 books including Paradoxology and uh, God is Stranger. He's the founding director of Home for Good, a young charity seeking to make a real difference in the lives of vulnerable children by finding them homes uh, in the care system. Krish and his wife have seven children through birth, fostering and adoption. Uh, Despite this, he somehow finds time to be a regular contributor to BBC Radio 4 uh, and Radio 2. He is a lecturer at Regent's Park College, Oxford, and an honorary research fellow at the University of St Andrews, and an ambassador for Tear Fund. Today, Chris will talk to us about his award-winning book, Paradoxology, Why Christianity Was Never Meant to be Simple and uh, how the paradoxes that appear to undermine belief are actually at the heart of a vibrant faith. He'll ask us to think about whether it's in the difficult parts of the Bible that God is most clearly revealed. Would you please welcome Dr Krish Kandai. Good afternoon everybody. Can you hear me okay? Brilliant, I'm very happy. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Um, what a place St Paul's is. I, I um, snuck into the, uh, the Eucharist service this morning and uh, what, what an incredible sense of the presence of God in such a beautiful building. And I'm excited about the, the fresh vision uh, this place has to serve God in, in London and further afield. Uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. Um, uh, we'll dig into uh, why I wrote Paradoxology. We might have a go at one of the paradoxes uh, and then we'll open it up for some questions. So that will be the plan. Um, so my name is Krish, uh, which is short for Krishna, um, which is, as you probably know, uh, a Hindu god. And uh, my father was born in Malaysia, but his father was born in Sri Lanka. And uh, my mother was born in India and her father was born in Ireland. So I'm slightly confused (laughs) about who I am, where I'm from, which team to support in uh, the Olympics. Uh, In football, it's really easy. That's Liverpool, but um, (laughs) because they're international like me, that's that's right. Um, So I, I was brought up in this kind of Hindu Catholic family and uh, was inducted a little bit into the Hindu faith and a little bit into the Catholic faith. Um, But my parents ultimately decided that it would be okay for me to have freedom of religion. Uh, They would allow me to choose for myself which faith I would follow. And when I was about seven years old, uh, there was a kind of minor earthquake in the town where I lived, Brighton. And it was a Sunday afternoon, I looked out the window to see what was going on. And uh, there was this marching band marching up our hill and the minor earthquake was just the bass drum uh, of this marching band and it was the Salvation Army and I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen when I was seven and so I asked my mum if I could go wherever that band was going and so I started to go to Sunday school at the Salvation Army. Now, to be honest, I was probably the brownest person in the Sunday school at the Salvation Army. I was the only one that didn't have the right uniform uh, and my parents weren't part of the army. Um, But I remember being explained uh, that to be a Christian meant to put your trust in what Jesus had done for you on the cross. And so when I was about seven years old, um, I, I go to the front of the Salvation Army Church and they have a special seat. It's called the Mercy Seat. Uh, it's not a seat you're supposed to sit on, it's a, it's a seat you're supposed to kneel uh, towards. And uh, a little old lady from the Salvation Army with a black bonnet and her polished shoes came and put an arm around me and said, do you know what you're doing? And I said, I, I want to I follow this Jesus. And uh, she said, well, let me help you. And she led me in a prayer. Uh, and I would say that was the beginning of my journey uh, towards the Christian faith. 
Um, now, I must admit, I did manage to keep that a secret from almost everybody I knew. Uh, I remember when I was 15, I was uh, at uh, secondary school. I went to an all boys secondary school in Brighton. Uh, it was uh, a pretty rough place. Um, it was the kind of place that the teacher would ask for leave to have a cigarette break during registration. And so she would leave us, the kids in the class, and our, our form room was a chemistry lab. So she left 30 teenage boys in charge of a chemistry lab. And uh, kids used to suck the gas out of the gas taps, try to light it on their breath. Uh, kids used to squirt, I don't know why we put it in bottles, but we had hydrochloric acid in squidgy bottles and there were acid fights going on. Anyway, in the middle of this chaos, one of the lads stood up and said, look, um, I, wanna, I wanna tell something to the class, is that okay? And the teacher gave him permission and he stood up and he said, well, last night, I became a Christian, I became a friend of God. It's the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me and I'd like you to all know about it. And I thought that was the bravest thing I'd ever seen anyone do live. And so I went to see him straight away and I told him off. I said, look, you, you obviously haven't been a Christian very long. It was only last night that you started following Jesus. But I've been doing this thing since I've been seven. And let me tell you, you're not supposed to tell anyone about it. It's a private thing between you and God. And uh, this mate of mine, he said to me, Chris, if you knew the God that I met last night, you wouldn't be able to be silent about him. And that really challenged me about whether I had a, a living relationship with God or whether I just had kind of churchianity or, or, or Salvation Armyanity. If, if that's all I had, this lad, even though he was only a few hours old in the faith, had something I didn't have. And that really challenged me. So um, Steve and I, we decided to divide the class into two. He took all the kids whose surnames began A to L. I took M to Z. And we, we were planning to explain our faith to our friends. That was the, the thing. Because if this Christianity thing was true, it wasn't just true for me or him. It was true for everybody. That's the nature of truth, isn't it? And so we started to try to share our faith. And, and we hit up a, bunch, a, a huge amount of questions. Um, how do you know the devil didn't write the Bible? That was a classic 15 year old question that we were raised. What about science and Christianity? Hasn't science disproved the existence of God? What about suffering? What about the other religions? How are you supposed to relate Christianity to those other faiths? And to be honest, it, it was in the middle of that kind of um, chaos of questions and, and working out my own faith that I came to a more profound understanding of the faith that I had. You see, a faith that isn't challenged might not be real. It might just be a borrowed faith, an inherited faith. But a faith that's open to question, that's willing to look at the difficult bits, uh, I think that's the kind of faith that the early church knew about. Because as they started to spread Christianity from uh, a tiny little bunch of disciples in, in Israel to the ends of the earth, they came up against a whole bunch of questions. And that's what unlocked the faith for so many around the world. So to cut a long story short, um, uh, we had a, a, a careers advisor come to our school. Do you, do, I don't know if they still do that. Is anyone young enough to remember careers advisors? And uh, I, I asked the career advisor why she became a career advisor. Uh, and she said, I couldn't think of anything better to do. And that's either the most brilliant answer or it's a terrible answer. She had no <laughs> real reason for being a careers advisor. And, and, and my mate and I thought, well, how could we share our faith with a careers advisor? What, 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 what could we say that would help her want to talk about the faith that we've just discovered? And so I decided to tell the careers advisor that I wanted to be a missionary because then my careers advisor would have to ask me, well, why do you want to be a missionary? And I'd have to explain this new faith that I had. And uh, I said, oh, my plan was to go to university, to study chemistry. Uh, I would become um, a, chem a world renowned chemist. I would work in Russia under the Iron Curtain and um, I would be a chemist by day, but a missionary by night. And uh, when I told my careers advisor this, she said, well, I don't think this plan is gonna work. You see, you have to be quite intelligent to get a degree in chemistry. <laughs> and uh, you've become a Christian, that obviously shows that you're not very intelligent. <laughs> and that's the assumption, isn't it? That to be a Christian means you have to switch your brain off. That faith is a blind leap into the dark, that you don't have to actually uh, think these things through. Christians, uh, as a friend of mine uh, used to describe them as well, are cabbages for Jesus. 
And actually that's not the perception that scripture has for us. And throughout history that hasn't been the way that the faith has been understood. And so even at that early age I understood that there was something important about knowing what we believe. Not just accepting it, not just blindly following, but knowing what we believe and knowing why we believe it. Let me jump you forward a few more years. And um, it was explained I run a charity. Um, let me tell you why I run that charity and then why I wrote that book and then we'll dig into our uh, theme at another level. So this book is about paradoxes, uh, about seemingly uh, contradictory things that actually find a tension in Jesus. But there is, a, there is a paradox, I think, in the church's worship right now. And if you're not a Christian, if you're exploring faith, you're very welcome here. Uh, but I, I need to have a little bit of an in-house conversation just for a few moments about what we mean by worship. You see, the Bible describes worship in James chapter 1, verse 27. Listen to this, see if you know how this verse ends. True religion that God our Father accepts as pure and blameless is... Do you know how that verse ends? For a lot of people, true religion that God our Father accepts as pure and blameless is a beautiful church building with organ recitals. Beautiful though that is, that isn't how the verse ends. In other traditions of the church, um, true religion, true worship that God our Father accepts as pure and blameless is biblically sound expository preaching, working verse by verse to teach the true doctrines of the church. Important as that is, that isn't how that verse ends either. Do you know how it ends? True religion that God our Father accepts as pure and blameless is to care for widows and orphans in their distress. That's an interesting requirement on our worship, isn't it? Why would God ask the church to respond to him by caring for the most vulnerable in society. Here's the paradox. If you ask the average person in a church today what worship is, most people will tell you it's either something to do with singing or it's something to do with preaching. That's what worship is. Or, or if you're lucky, it might involve communion at the taking of the bread and the wine. But that is not a biblical definition of worship. And you're going, oh, Chris, James, you're talking about the book of James. Didn't Martin Luther say that was an epistle of straw? I'm not sure we should pay much attention to the book of James. Well, how about the prophet Isaiah? Is that, is that more acceptable? Uh, Isaiah, I discovered recently, has, has more than one chapter. Uh, I, I grew up in a church that only knew about Isaiah chapter 53 because it's the one that prophesies how Jesus is going to die. It's an amazing chapter, well worth a read. But there, there are other chapters. Um, how about Isaiah chapter 1, where God says to the church, you know what, or, or Israel at the time, he says, I, I want you to stop bringing your meaningless sacrifices. I want you to stop lifting up your hands in prayer. Uh, your assemblies are nothing to me. I hate them. I detest them, says the Lord. I'm going, God, God, hang on. Didn't you invent prayer and sacrifices and assemblies? Why are you so angry? Well, God says, it, it's not what you're doing here that's wrong. You know, prayer is great and, and, and worship is great and sacrifices are great. It, it's what you're neglecting to do because you're spending so much time on liturgical Worship. You haven't pled the cause of the widow or the orphan. Or Isaiah 58, maybe you're familiar with that one. Uh, it says, God says, um, is this what I call a fast? And I don't know about you, I find fasting one of the most difficult of spiritual disciplines. Uh, I struggle to fast between meals. <laughs> but Isaiah 58 says, you know what? All this fasting, it's, it's, it's useless, it's worthless. Because you haven't shared your food with the hungry. You haven't welcomed the stranger. So here's the paradox, isn't it? What the church, what we the church want to offer God in worship is very different from what God actually asked us to offer him in worship. When our worship becomes just an external practice, something we do with our mouths or something we do uh, with our hearts, something's missing. Because God says, I want you to contend for the poor, the widow and the orphan. Best way I can think of, of, of putting this is, look, when I was 15, uh, it was Mother's Day and I had a real problem. Uh, I couldn't decide what to buy my mum. It's hard to buy your mum a present on Mother's Day when you're 15. But I went shopping in Brighton Town Centre and uh, I, I was magnetically drawn to HMV. Do you know this shop? 
I don't know if it still exists anymore, it was a record shop back in the day, uh, and I bought a cassette of Lionel Richie dancing on the ceiling. And uh, on Mother's Day I wrapped it up and I presented it to my mother, and there were two small problems with my gift for my mother. Number one, my mother didn't own a cassette player. <laughs> Number two, my mother didn't actually like Lionel Richie. <laughs> Guess who liked Lionel Richie and guess who had a cassette player? What an awful son I was. I didn't give her what she, what she wanted. I gave her what I wanted. That's the paradox I think we may have in worship at the moment. There are certain things we want in worship. We want to feel transcendent. We want to feel close to God. We want to feel intimate with him. Uh, we want beautiful music or we want sound preaching. And God says all those things are important for sure. But don't neglect caring for the widow and the orphan. So that's why my charity exists, to kind of put that paradox right. To say, yes, let's sing to God with all our hearts. Let's explore his word with our minds for sure. But let's, let's let that empower us to care for those that are vulnerable. Because God says he is a father to the fatherless and a protector of widows and orphans. And so if we're going to be Christians, to be people that walk in the footsteps of Jesus, then those need to be our priorities too. So that's, that's why I started my charity. But I've, re I've recognised, I guess, as, as um, somebody who's trying to influence the church to help us think differently about what God calls us to do in worship, one of the big problems is Christians aren't really comfortable with the Bible. Um, it, it's our book, whatever tradition of the church you come from, whether you consider yourself uh, a progressive or a conservative, it's our book. There's no wing of the church that doesn't take the Bible seriously. There's no church that says the Bible's unimportant to who we are. And yet we're struggling to read it and we're struggling to understand it. And one of the problems I think is um, there are parts of the Bible that have become toxic to us and difficult to grapple with. And because of that, we're kind of nervous to open it at all. I, I don't know if you remember, uh, my one doesn't, I think it's uh, on purpose. Um, you remember those Bibles that used to have gold leaf around the outside? Yeah. yeah? Do, do, do you remember, well, have you any idea why they have gold leaf around the outside? Uh, I, I wonder whether it's um, so that everyone else can tell which bits you've been reading. Because the bits that have the gold leaf worn off, that's where you feel comfortable. Does that make sense? Those are the bits that you come to again and again. And for many Christians, we're kind of okay with the Gospels. They're nice, they're, they're kind of friendly. Uh, we like some of the New Testament epistles, um, a few of them. Some of the Psalms, I mean, some of the Psalms are a little bit difficult, scary, embarrassing, but a lot of the Old Testament is completely virgin territory to us. It's not somewhere we're safe to go. And that's because God does some really strange things there. He doesn't kind of fit my expectations of what the God I kind of want to worship would do or look like. And so this book, Paradoxology, was an attempt to kind of demine parts of the Bible that had become toxic to many Christians. And a lot of it's in the Old Testament, uh, but some of it is in the New Testament too. Let me give you a flavour. Um, I've got to be honest, my wife and I, we write together. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great, I have to travel quite a lot for my work and so if I'm writing um, and my wife's reading it and commenting, we're kind of both in each other's imagination at the same time. It's quite romantic and uh, we enjoy that. Um, and some of the best bits of this book belong to her. Um, she's a very private person so doesn't want to be on the front cover. Um, and it's, it's awkward when you have to write I, comma, Krish or I, comma, Miriam. So it's just in my voice, but uh, she wrote some of the best bits of this book. L let me give you an overview of where the book goes, um, as, as that may help you think of questions for later. Um, so the first chapter is called The Abraham Paradox, the God who needs nothing but asks for everything. Or how about the Moses Paradox, the God who is far away but so close? Or the Joshua paradox, the God who is terribly compassionate. You might remember the book of Joshua includes what some might describe as ancient genocide. Or the Job paradox, the God who is actively inactive. What do we do about all the suffering that we experience? Where is God in that? The Hosea paradox, the God who is faithful to the unfaithful. Uh, you might remember Hosea is asked to marry a prostitute. Why, why would God ask someone 
to do that. That's not your normal worship service, is it? Uh, the Habakkuk paradox, the God who is consi consistently unpredictable. Uh, the Jonah paradox, the God who is indiscriminately selective. Uh, the Esther paradox, the God who speaks silently. And then we move to the New Testament, the Jesus paradox, the God who is divinely human. The Judas paradox, the God who determines our free will. The cross paradox, the God who wins as he loses. The Roman paradox, the God who is effectively ineffective. And the Corinthian paradox, the God who fails to disappoint. Um, so just allow those to kind of linger in your mind a bit as we consider um, some of the overarching themes in the book and then maybe in question time you might want to drill into some of those particular ones. Let me give you six headings uh, that might help you understand what I'm trying to do in the book and, and I hope it will help you consider your faith differently. Uh, so the first heading is, is no fear, no fear. Uh, I remember when I was uh, at that all boys secondary school and even though we were a comprehensive school we were a rugby school. Uh, rugby normally belongs to other types of schools but we were still a rugby school and that uh, we were invited to play a very posh school uh, a bit up the road from where our little comprehensive was in Brighton. It was called Christ's Hospital and uh, you turned up and everyone was in 18th century costume and it, and it wasn't a special day that was just what they wore and uh, our ragtag bunch of um, comprehensive boys uh, were a bit overawed turning up and we thought it was amazing they fed us a three course meal before we played uh, but now we realise that might have been a strategy so that we didn't <laughs> play particularly well and uh, I, wasn't very, I wasn't very brilliant at rugby but I was fast um, and I was wearing glasses back then and you weren't allowed to wear glasses on the rugby pitch and we weren't, my family weren't into contact lenses. Uh, so sometimes the, 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 uh, the teammates had to kind of line me up so I was pointing in <laughs> the right direction. And the coach just said to me, he said, look, what, whatever you do, as soon as you can, take out their biggest player. Just let him know you're there because that will strike fear into the rest of the team and you'll be able to walk all over them. Uh, so that was my job, you know, run down the wing, knock out the big player, you know, knock out, take him out gently but effectively, and uh, then we would have overrun them, that was the plan. And I guess with this, this book, that's what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to look at the things that people might find most difficult, and if we can help you understand that, maybe it will help you feel freer about enjoying the whole of the Bible. You do not need to be embarrassed about the God of the Old Testament. A lot of Christians are. A lot of Christians have listened to Richard Dawkins, uh, who has a whole litany of things that's wrong with the Old Testament. And I want to say, actually, there is a way of understanding what God is doing in the Old Testament that we don't need to fear. The other thing uh, that I want to encourage people to do is to recognise that faith should not be fragile. Okay? So for, some people are worried that if, if they ask questions about their faith, their faith will evaporate. It's like that your faith is like a crystal vase that you have to protect from the dangerous world out there. And you do that by hiding it away from those really tough questions. But I think if that's your approach, we've misunderstood the nature of faith. For people like Richard Dawkins, faith is knowing, or sorry, believing what you know isn't true. That's what, that's what Richard Dawkins and co think. Faith is, is, is just hoping against hope that it's all true, even though we really deep down know it isn't. And, and so asking questions will, will shine a light on the shadow of our faith and it will just evaporate. I want you to conceptualise faith a different way. So uh, you, you, may, um, you may have had to cross a road to come here today. That's possible, isn't it? Now imagine you were standing at the side of the road and you thought to yourself, well, can I ever be philosophically certain that I can get from where I'm standing across the road? And you might say to yourself, well, you know what? I don't think I can ever be philosophically certain about it. Because it's possible those clever guys at Jaguar Land Rover, they might have invented an invisible electric car. I mean, that would be the worst of all worlds, wouldn't it? Because you can't hear it coming and you can't see it coming. So as you step out, you could get mown down by it. That's, that's the end of you. Or as you step out into the road, you might step into some a super glue and there might just happen to be a steamroller inching its way towards you. <laughs> that is possible, isn't it? And so if you can never be philosophically certain that you can cross from here to there, well, is all you've got blind faith then? 
So if you can never know for sure that you're gonna make it across the road, you just stick your fingers in your ears, close your eyes, scream at the top of your voice and just run for it, hoping nothing will hit you. Is that all we've got? Absolute certainty or blind faith? That seems to be the way that people like Richard Dawkins want to conceptualize it. Christianity is that blind faith, hoping against hope, against science and reason that it's all true, when we know it really isn't. But actually, when it, when it comes to crossing a road, what do you do? Well, you, you gather information, uh, you, you think about your past, you, you, you uh, try to project things into the future, you hypothesize, and then at some point when you're convinced, not beyond all possible doubt, but beyond reasonable doubt, you step out. And that step's a big deal, isn't it? Because, you know, your life is in your hands. And yet you step out, that step, is the step of faith. It's not uninformed, it's not blind, it's not certainty, but it's responding to what you believe to be true based on evidence. And I think that's what's going on in the Bible. When Jesus says um, to Thomas, Thomas says, how, how can we know? You know, how can we know? And Jesus says, you know, haven't you been uh, among me all this time and you still don't know? This is John 14. He says, believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. You go, whoa. Jesus, you're presenting epistemic reasons to trust him. The miracles that Jesus performed are supposed to be part of the reason we believe he's true. Or, or John does the same at the end of John's gospel. He says, these are written so that you might know. In other words, I'm trying to persuade you that this stuff is true. Therefore, faith needs to have no fear because I only want to be a Christian if it's true. If it's not true, what's the point? In fact, Paul said, if it's only for this life that we have faith in Jesus, then we're to be pitied more than all men. Why is that? Because being a Christian is incredibly costly. It's challenging. It sets you in, in opposition to the status quo. Uh, it will ask you to do incredibly generous things, like welcome the stranger and feed the hungry. It will ask you to love your enemies. It will ask you to put other people's needs ahead of your own. It means that we're not playing a game that whoever's got the most amount of stuff at the end of our days wins the game. We're playing a completely different game. It's called the kingdom of God. That's why Paul says, if only for this life we have faith in Jesus, then we're to be pitied more than all men because we've given up so much to follow him. So I wrote this book because I want there to be no fear, no fear in our understanding of God. Let's go after the tough stuff. Because if it's true, brilliant, that's going to confirm our faith. And if it's actually false, will we give up on something that we've been wasting our time on? Nothing to lose. Uh, no division. Um, I think for many Christians I meet, and I meet a lot of uh, university students and professionals, um, there is this division in their life. They can be world class in their understanding of their profession or their area of study. You know, I, I th think about it, the, the, the average A-level student it is studying kind of nuclear physics in the classroom. But in Sunday school, what are we giving them? What's, what's the differential? Or, or the average uh, you know, Christian business executive, uh, there's their understanding of the world of business, but where's their understanding of the faith? Often there's a huge gap in our understanding. We've, we've thought hard about our professional life, but we haven't thought hard about our spiritual life. And that disparity means that the, 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 the gospel our faith is not permeating every part of our society. It's not permeating every part of our life because of this division. If we're not confident that what we believe is true, then you become like me at my secondary school. Shh, don't tell anybody. Because someone might ask you a question and then you won't have anything to back it up. And so we kind of retreat into this kind of privatised, personalised religion. I was giving a talk the other day um, at an MOD facility in Bristol and uh, there was a lady there that identified as uh, Christian and LGBT and she said, you know what, it was easier for me to come out as a lesbian than it was for me to come out as a Christian. And I thought that was interesting. What, why is that? Some of that is about the way that society understands Christianity. And some of it is about how we as Christians understand our faith. I don't want to be public about this because it's going to embarrass me. I'm either going to get socially embarrassed because if, if you think I'm a Christian, you might think I'm one of those Christians that supports Donald Trump. 
um, or that, that, that you know there was a recent survey in the US uh, white evangelical Christians apparently are the least hospitable or the least um, agreeing that the government of the United States should welcome refugees of every sector in American society white evangelicals were the least likely to say the government should welcome refugees and so if you go public as a Christian someone might think you're one of those kind of Christians over there in the States so you're socially embarrassed but you might also be epistemically embarrassed because someone might ask you well, what about these really awkward bits in the Bible? Isn't the Bible sexist? Isn't God uh, pro-genocide? What about science? You'll, you'll have that problem. So again, paradoxology was trying to deal with the idea that there should be no fear, but also that there should be no division uh, between our private faith and our public life, our confidence in our uh, abilities in the workplace and our confidence in the faith. We ought to have a unified, integrated life. I guess also I want to say that um, we need to think about Christianity as not being a honeymoon. No honeymoon is my, my third uh, leader. I once met a, a couple who were in their 60s uh, who said they had never had an argument. In six, uh, what was it? I think it was 40 years of marriage, they'd never had an argument. And some people go, that's amazing, isn't that fantastic? And I actually think that's a little bit worrying, isn't it? What, what kind of marriage would never have an argument? B biblically, uh, we're all kind of flawed. We've all got problems fighting our ego and our self. And so the idea that two people from two you know, different families will be able to live in perfect marital bliss forever, never needing to have an argument, is biblically difficult to understand. Does that make sense? We're all fallen, we're all flawed. Uh, we've all got you know, broken hearts and broken um, minds and therefore the chances of us never arguing are very slim. In fact, it reminded me of, of a film. I don't, oh, there was a book before it. It, it talks about a, a young woman who moves to the suburbs. And uh, when she moves to the suburbs, she notices there are these married couples who live in this marital bliss, blissful state. Now, the husbands go out and work and then they come home and then their wives are dressed immaculately looking like they've just walked out of a salon and they ask their husbands oh you know i'm sure you've had a tough day uh, let me fix you some 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 lovely food and, and then this gourmet food comes prepared by this woman that looks like she's just walked out of a beauty salon and it's, it's just incredible and she just can't understand what's going on do you know the name of this book do you know the name of this film the stepford wives do you know why there are no arguments? It's because the wives, well, there's two versions actually. One, one version of the film says the wives have been killed and replaced by robots. The other one is that the wives have been chipped. So uh, little kind of digital devices have been put in the brains of the wives, so they're always compliant. Now, here, here's the interesting thing for me. Have you ever disagreed with God? Have you ever disagreed with God? Has God ever said something, either in scripture or to you, uh, you know, through prophecy or impression, that you've disagreed with? I wanna say to you, if you've never disagreed with God, there's probably something wrong with your relationship with God. The only God that we never disagree with is a Stepford God. A God that we've taken the real God, who's kind of awkward and difficult and, and majestic and powerful and holy and, and, and transcendent, and we've replaced him with a God that we like, an edited God. I remember when I was first given a Bible by um, an auntie. She wasn't a real auntie because I'm Indian and we called all older women aunties when I was a child. Um, but she gave me a Bible and it had a red thing on the outside, not gold, we weren't that, like that, but uh, enough that you could tell which bits I've been reading. But she also gave me a highlighter pen. Have you ever thought about the concept of a highlighter pen? And the Bible. What, what, what are you supposed to do with the highlighter pen? Well, God, we kind of like this bit over here. You know, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and give you a future. That's a good bit. I'll have that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of this Old Testament stuff's a bit rubbish. How, how about John, John 3.16? That's a good one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Great. I'll have a bit of that. Or uh, Revelation 3.20. I stand at the door and knock and whoever opens the door and I, uh, I will come in and eat with him and, and he will eat with me. Oh, that's good. I'll have that bit. That's the way you create a Stepford God. 
or you edit out the awkward, difficult parts of the Bible because you, they, they don't suit you. They're not the kind of God that you want to believe in. And so you highlight the bits of the God that you do want. And we create our own God that's actually more like me than God. If we're not careful, God becomes a ventriloquist dummy. He doesn't speak for himself. He only speaks what we allow him to say. That's scary, isn't it? That's how we end up with a God who supports whatever political party I support, who has the same political views as me, who never challenges me about my finances or how I treat the poor. He just tells me whatever I want to hear. So I want to say there shouldn't be a honeymoon with God. It shouldn't be that you, you're always living in a state of bliss, um, that there's never any tension, there's never any arguments. You know, the Psalms are full of people arguing with God. You know, Habakkuk is a book about someone arguing with God. You know, David and Abraham argue with God. Why? Because God's doing stuff they can't understand or they don't agree with. And I think that's really healthy because God isn't my God. You know, he doesn't belong to me. He's not on a leash. I haven't domesticated him. He's, he's not a little tabby cat God. He's described in the Old Testament as a lion, a roaring lion doesn't belong to me I belong to him and therefore he needs to have first place finally let me just give you this little bit before we open it up for some questions I, I want to say no boxes no boxes let's not try and cut God down to size so that he fits my nice neat life I, I, I love studying theology but I'm slightly nervous about some forms of systematic theology. Because it's like you're trying to take God and make him fit in a system. Um, so, you know, is God Calvinist or Arminian? Is he reformed or charismatic? Is he a liberation theology God or, or you know, a, a prosperity gospel God? Which, which one is he? Which side is he on? Well, God doesn't kind of work like that, does he? God blows up every box that people try to put him in. One of my favourite films uh, growing up uh, was called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Do you know this film? It's a brilliant film. It, if, you, if, if you've not heard of Indiana Jones, um, let me just recommend, just, just watch the first film. All the rest were pretty rubbish. The first one was amazing. And uh, there's, there's, there's a, uh, as you might guess, there is a problem. The Nazis have been reading the Old Testament and they think that if they can get a hold of the original Ark of the Covenant, they will have a weapon of mass destruction. All they need to do is track it down and then like Israel did in some of their battles, they need to put the Ark of the Covenant at the front of their army and then they will be invincible. Do you see what they're doing? They think they can put God in a box, a commandeer God so that he supports the Nazi cause. You with me? But the Nazis have not factored in Indiana Jones. By day, he is a archeology span professor. By night, he is a world changing adventurer. And, and he's trapped down the Ark of the Covenant. And um, there's a bit where he, he's, he's in a pit and he's found the Ark of the Covenant in a pit. And the pit is full of snakes. And uh, the thing is that, that, that Indiana Jones has been one step ahead of the Nazis in, in order to find the Ark. But the problem of being one step ahead of the Nazis is it means they're just peeping over your shoulder. And so as soon as Indiana Jones finds the Ark, the Nazis find it too. There's a theory out there that says Indiana Jones shouldn't have bothered. And then the Nazis would never have found the Ark. <laughs> but anyway, Indiana Jones has, has tracked down the Ark of the Covenant and uh, the Nazis have taken it. And they put it in a box and they put it inside a submarine. And, um, and they put the Nazi insignia all over the box so that it'll blend in with the other boxes. And, and then uh, this uh, uh, submarine uh, manages to go from somewhere near Egypt to somewhere near the Galapagos Islands. I'm not quite sure how they made that route. Uh, is that a possible route? You tell me, my geography is rubbish. But the, the lucky thing is that for the whole of that journey, this submarine has not submersed. It's been on the surface the whole time, which is really lucky because Indiana Jones has been hanging on to the outside of the submarine. <laughs> and he's, he's amazing, but I don't think he could hold his breath for 6,000 miles. That would have been complicated. 
Anyway, he gets to the Galapagos Islands and there's this big ceremony going on and, um, and the Nazis open up the Ark of the Covenants. And as they open it up, the, the angel of the Lord comes out. And, and, you know, it's like Steven Spielberg has been reading Psalm 68. It talks about, you know, they melt like wax because the, the awesome majesty of God bursts out. And, and, and that film scared the living daylights out of me when I was a young boy. But theologically, it was very profound, wasn't it? That God doesn't belong to anybody. He's not the Nazi God. He's not even the Allies God. He stands above all of us. And he doesn't fit into our political systems. He doesn't fit into our theological systems. There's a, there's a moment in that Indiana Jones movie when uh, they're just about to move this box that contains the Ark of the Covenant out into the Galapagos Islands. But something has happened to the box. It's like the glory of God burnt off all the Nazi insignias. And I thought, what an amazing picture that we need to unleash God, allow him to be who he is in scripture, all of scripture, not just our edited highlights, all of it. And if that means changing our systems, changing our way of thinking, changing our preconceptions, then that's what we want. Because I don't know about you, but I want the real God. I don't want a fake God. I don't want an idol. I don't want a ventriloquist dummy. I don't want a Stepford God. I want to know the real God. And that's why I think sometimes it's in the most difficult parts of the Bible, the bits that don't fit our normal assumptions, that I know I'm hitting against reality rather than projection. I'm engaging the true and living transcendent God that wants to make himself known. So that's the concept behind the book. And uh, I'm gonna now uh, throw it open for some questions. Are you gonna host this part, Jonathan? Uh, that's right, I will share it. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for uh, such <laughs> Do stay by the microphone. Um, for us now to ask our own questions. Sometimes it takes a while to process those questions, but does anybody like to start off with a question? Thank you. Um, uh, sorry, uh, thank you very much indeed for the fabulous uh, talk. Pleasure. First of all, I think we thoroughly enjoyed that. But on, on a sort of uh, a difficult note, for me, mm. you have the Christ of the sword and the anger and the physical mm. anger of throwing people out of temples and so on, and then you have turning the other cheek, blessing the peacemakers and so on. Yeah. How do you deal with that sort of fundamental paradox, which I think is inherent in the... Yes, story, really good. We saw in our service. Very good. Thank you. That's a helpful question. So, I, I guess, when you read about Jesus, and there, there are two different strategies that people have for reading about Jesus. So some people like the reading about Jesus mainly through the epistles where we, we kind of learn more about the function of Jesus or the purpose of Jesus. Um, so I, I grew up with an understanding of the gospel that there was God on one side and, and me on the other side. And the way that that chasm was bridged was through a, you know, a cross. And, and we take this, this idea that Jesus was, was kind of a means to an end. Uh, he came in order that we might have eternal life. He's a bridge. Um, and, We've done something odd to Jesus in that. We've, we've objectified him. We've taken Jesus in all his beauty and majesty and glory and personality and we've, we've turned him into a means for me to get to heaven. That's all he is. Does that, does that make sense? It's a very one-dimensional view of Jesus. The, the other way is, is to read the Gospels. And when you read the Gospels, Jesus is continually surprising people, isn't he? So, so think about it. So three times Jesus uh, in Mark's gospel, for example, uh, predicts that he's going to be killed. He's going to be handed over to the chief priests and, and the, the Pharisees and they're going to kill him. But on the third day, he's going to rise again. Um, and each time he says that, there's, there's a problem with the disciples. One of the most famous times is when Peter says, no, Lord. No, Lord, that, that can't be right because we know what you're here to do. You're here to usher in the new kingdom. You're the Messiah. Uh, you're going to help win victory over these nasty Romans. You're going to uh, institute the restoration of Israel. That's what you're going to do. So, so don't give us any of this rubbish about dying on a cross. That doesn't fit my idea. And remember Jesus says to Peter something pretty scary. Um, he says, get behind me, Satan. In other words, somehow through you right now, that the devil is speaking more than you, Peter. 
And so I guess what I want to say is that when you read the Gospels, there is a, a three-dimensional, complicated picture of Jesus. You know, he isn't this kind of doormat Jesus, uh, where, you know, he, he, he just comes and he's just smiling at everybody. He's kind of like a, a, an early version of Father Christmas. It doesn't really matter if you're naughty or nice. Everyone's going to get presents. It's fine. And then there's, there's this other picture of Jesus, the kind of uh, Che Guevara Jesus. I don't know if you've seen those uh, t-shirts. I think the Church of England may have, at some point in the 90s, um, taken a picture of Che Guevara and morphed it into a picture of Jesus. Do you remember that? And it, the, the subtitle was Meek and Mild As If. In other words, Jesus is like this liberation man. And, and Che Guevara is a pretty nasty piece of work, according to some readings. Um, not, not worried about, you know, murdering people that he disagree with. So, so some people want the kind of meek and mild Jesus. Some people want the Che Guevara Jesus. He's neither of those. And both of those in one sense, isn't he? So he's neither of those because um, Jesus was the most compassionate person that has ever lived. The people that were drawn to him and attracted to him were all the wrong kinds of people. He gets in trouble all the time for who he's having dinner with. How can you eat with tax collectors, sinners and prostitutes? Jesus, that's not the kind of people that you ought to be associating with. You ought to be associating with nice, you know, middle class people like us, not, not the riffraff. And, and so to those people, to the marginalised, Jesus was incredibly welcoming. But to the, uh, the elites, the religious leaders, the people he would describe as whitewashed tombs, do you remember that? Uh, the Pharisees, the leadership, he's saying, look, I'm opposed to you. You know, you think you're in the kingdom of God, let me tell you, these, these people are entering ahead of you. And so when he needed to, Jesus was, was chucking people out of the temple because this whole practice was excluding another group of people from coming in. Do you remember where, where those um, market stalls were? That was where, that was called the court of the Gentiles. In other words, the unwashed and unclean, this was the part of the temple they were allowed to be in. So when Jesus chucks them out, he says, my house, my father's house should be a house of prayer for all the nations. So which one is he, meek and mild or Che Guevara? No, neither. He will, he'll be incredibly welcoming to the penitent, to those that know they haven't measured up to God's standards, but he will stand against hypocrisy and judgmentalism and he'll drive them out of the temple. So he, he's both. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Um, someone want to try different? I'll try and be shorter next time. Uh, you at the back. Thank you. Um, I was actually at Oxford for a Christian conference on business. And oh, great. good question so look, as a Christian person we have lots of diff I've got to repeat this for the thing so how, how do we find a balance between um, I suppose radical discipleship where we might be called to war-torn areas or welcoming the vulnerable and you know being a parent how do those two things fit together I think as as Christians we've always got kind of multiple callings on us at the same time so for example I'm, I'm supposed to love the Lord my God with all my heart soul and mind some people take that calling you know, well, there they you go, that's obvious. I should go out into the desert, I should live up a pole, and I should just spend my entire time loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul and mind. Uh, and, you know, some of the desert fathers, that was their experience of how they worshipped God. But there was another calling on you as well, wasn't there? Which was to love your neighbour as yourself. That's really hard to do up a pole, you know, relying on everybody to bring you food every day, um, far away from everybody else. Okay, so we have to love God and we have to love our neighbour. In fact, if we don't love our neighbour, we don't love God. That's 1 John's summary of what's going on. If you see a brother or sister in need and you don't try to help them, how can the love of God be in you? That's what, that's what he says. Or Matthew 25 is probably a pretty scary parable. Do you remember the sheep and the goats? And what's the differentiator between those that are in the kingdom and those that aren't in the kingdom? It's how you've responded to 
the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, and the stranger. It's not, have you not committed any sins? No, it's what have you done for those that are in need? Have you passed on the grace of God? So equally though, there were, there were some Christian, well, some Jewish um, believers in, in Jesus' day that were saying, you know what, um, I, know, I know it says you're supposed to kind of look after your mother and father, but you, you could just give your money to God instead, but we'll call it Corban and then it'll be okay. And Jesus is so angry with them. He said, you, you can't do that. You can't say, I'm, I'm going to love God and not care for the other people in my life. So there's always a balance to be struck. Here's the thing. Um, sometimes we make interesting decisions about our families. So I ask people, you know, as a Christian parent, what are your dreams and aspirations for your children? And some people say, well, I want them to be healthy, brilliant. You know, I want them to flourish, great. I want them to get a great education, fantastic. I want them to, you know, be physically fit and play sport. I want them to play a musical instrument, amazing. Now, now tell me, in, in what ways is that any different from a non-Christian vision for parenting? Is, is there anything distinctive about being a Christian parent than being just a great parent? Because I think non-Christian people can be great parents. What's distinctive about being a Christian parent? Well. As a parent, I want my children to love Jesus and to look like Jesus. Not, not physically, I want their, their character to look like Christ. Well, what did Christ's character look like? Well, he was gracious and compassionate and he stood up for justice and, and righteousness and, and he was fearless and he was trusting in God. Okay, how can I help my children to become those things? Well, we could do a little Bible study on it every day, couldn't we? That, that'd be great. Or we could pray for them to have that or I could show them films that would inspire those values. All amazing. Or, and you could model it to them. Um, and, and that doesn't mean you have to go and leave your family and you know, work in a war-torn country. I don't think that's the, necessarily the, the, the calling for a family person. But does your daily life demonstrate the character of Jesus? What are the ways that that can happen? You know, for, for our family, and, and there are plenty of other ways you could do this, but for a fostering family, for example, when you welcome children in who have come from a refugee context and they're telling you about some of the things that their families have experienced and, and, and the danger and fear they have about where the rest of their family are, your, your kids are drawn into that world. And alongside us parents, my kids are caring for these children too. They're practicing the character of Jesus day by day by day. And so little bit by little bit, they're becoming more Christ-like. So, does, does that help a little bit? Okay. Um, someone on this side, yes, please. Yes, you mentioned in passing the light of the world. Uh, mm. Incidentally, you just yeah, to see a copy of the Padma Foundation. Oh, yeah, amazing. The original of that is beautiful. In my college, uh, keyboard also. That's yes, I've amazing. been there, it's wonderful. Yes, indeed. Well, parents have a duty. There is a saying that train of the child in which you both your parents are Christian and mm. your child. Uh, you have the duty yes. to lead them to the church. But your friend, mm. who after 48 hours of finding Christ, came to the classroom mm. and announced, and you have met Christ since the age of 11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You kept quiet about it. Yes. In Africa, mm. where my country of origin, we hear from time to time in Nigeria and other places where Christians have been persecuted. Yes. And it's, it's very sad. But what I could not understands. During the Colossian days, suppose we are born as the Colossian of the Colossian days, the Christian missionaries saw a great deal for the spread of Christianity yes. in Africa, but it depended on the government to protect them because some of our ancestors were savages who were eating. They were eating them or something. Sure. Like so you had the government, the government to come oh. to, to their aid. Which is stronger? Should we keep quiet about our faith and allow our children to follow our examples mm. or we have to force them to be Christians, which is better? Okay, wow, big, big question. Um, so just to summarize, in case it didn't come out for the audio, uh, which, is, which is better, um, to be open about our faith and allow our children to decide for themselves or, or to force them to be Christians, is that, is that what you said? Well, persuade them, not force Persuade them, okay, yeah. So, so I, I think the Bible is really strong. Uh, it comes up in my Judas chapter, actually. Um, that there's this interesting paradox, isn't there, between a God who is sovereignly in control of everything. Yeah? Uh, nothing really happens without um, God's permission in one way or another. 
Um, and that's how you can have things like uh, prophecies being fulfilled. You know, in the Old Testament, it, Isaiah 53, we talked about that earlier. Uh, there's some very particular details that are spelt out about how the Messiah will die. And in order for that to happen, God needs to sovereignly be in charge of history. Or, or, or prayer, for example. We, we believe that when we pray, somehow, mysteriously, God kind of acts. Um, or we believe that the promises that God makes in the Bible will one day actually be fulfilled. It, they're, not, they're not temporary, they're not um, untrustworthy, they're utterly reliable. So, so there's a strong belief that God is in charge. And yet, the Bible also seems to teach that you and I have responsibility that we have to take responsibility for our actions. That if we do something evil, we can't say, God made me do it, or the devil made me do it. We've got to take some responsibility. That's why there is such a thing as punishment in the Bible. So that tension between um, divine providence and human free will is a really difficult one to match. But there it is in scripture. Um, I've got an illustration if you want it later, if we've got time. Um, but when it comes to, to parenting, I think we want to offer the same thing. So um, as a parent, I have a huge amount of responsibility for my children. Um, I'm held accountable for how I've loved them and cared for them and nourished them and educated them. Um, but in the end, those children have to come to a point of decision for themselves. To be honest, and this is really controversial because I'm in a cathedral, you know, I'm Baptist. Have I just lost the room now? <laughs> I feel like a, a, a da, uh, was it a lion in the den of Daniels now. So, so the Baptist tradition would say that I can't, or, or I can't even be a godparent and make promises or decisions on behalf of someone else. In the end, the child has got to make decisions for themselves when they come to a, a time when they're un understanding. So there's this tension going on, you know, can you um, impart your faith to somebody else or has it got to be taken and received and believed for themselves? I'm a Baptist, I come down on that line there. We're not that far apart. Anglicans have the same idea when it comes to confirmation that a child is making a, a decision that I'm going to own the faith that's been transmitted onto me. Um, the parable of the prodigal son is probably an interesting one. So there you have the father. Um, who has only shown love. This is God in the parable, isn't it? He, he has only love for the son, and yet the son still chooses to run away and have nothing to do with him. Now, should the father have locked the son in the room and said, no, of course you're not going to go and have your inheritance now. You're going to stay here until you come to your senses. No, the father lets the son go. And the, the father is incredibly gracious when the son realises he's went the wrong way, and he welcomes him home. And so for me as a parent, that's, that's my model. I say, look, I want to give you the best I can. I want to pass on my faith to you enthusiastically. But in the end, you've got to come to your own senses for yourself. And my job as a parent is to love you indiscriminately. If you choose to adopt my faith, brilliant, love you. If you choose not to, I'm still going to be as committed to you. And my prayer is that one day you will. Does, does that help? Yeah. Okay, great. Are we all right for one more? Or we got to finish? I think we'll probably have to draw the stuff. Okay, so fair enough. It it's not because I'm a Baptist we're closing up early. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> well, thank you very much indeed for helping us to sort of navigate our way through some of the challenges and the, the complexities of, of the Christian faith. Um, and thank you too for your questions and uh, insights. There is a copy of the book, there is. Uh, Paradoxology, available for you to buy if you'd like to uh, afterwards. Um, but thank you very much indeed. We are truly grateful for the time.